we all probably take our GI system for granted. Um, our bodily functions work the way they're supposed to, and we get all the food and nutrition and fluids that we need, and we don't really think about it. But that's not the case for patients with Crohn's disease. It can be a really intrusive um, autoimmune disease that can affect all aspects of life, both physical health and even social emotional health. Let's talk about it today. Now Crohn's disease falls under an umbrella of inflammatory bowel disease. There's actually two different diseases that fall under inflammatory bowel disease, both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Now we're gonna save ulcerative colitis for another day, um, but inflammatory bowel disease in general as this umbrella term um, is a disease process that causes inflammation of the bowel and therefore GI dysfunction. And when our GI system dysfunctions, patients are going to experience things like loss of, uh, loss of appetite, weight loss, fatigue, diarrhea, fever and abdominal pain, and urgent bowel movements. Now, there are some things that vary between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, and we'll get into that a little bit today, more another day. Um, but today, just understand that we're going to be talking about Crohn's disease, which is under this umbrella of inflammatory bowel disease. Now, um, inflammatory bowel disease affects about 1.6 million Americans, with the highest risk being those of ca Caucasian descent, and specifically those from the um, Ashkenazi Jewish population, although we are seeing a rise in incidence among African American populations as well, and they think it has to do with the modern diet and um, the higher animal protein and all the additives in our food these days that's causing more inflammation in many people's gut. The most common onset time of this is 15 to 35 years old. Now, um, the exact cause of this is unknown, but it is an autoimmune disorder, which means that the body attacks its own cells, and specifically this time, the cells of the GI tract. Um, and it's so it's an inappropriate response to the intestinal tract that causes inflammation and therefore um, lack of function, loss of function. And with all autoimmune disorders, it's always genetics plus trigger. So there's some genetic component there, family history, Caucasian, 15 to 35, plus some kind of trigger um, that kind of causes this cascade to happen. And different triggers can be smoking, um, infections like the Epstein-Barr -Bar virus, uh, certain medications, and even certain foods have been linked to Crohn's disease, specifically things like cow's milk and refined sugar. Now, what's interesting about Crohn's disease versus ulcerative colitis is Crohn's disease can cause patches of inflammation throughout the gut. In fact, really throughout the whole GI tract. So they can have um, inflammation and sores anywhere from their GI tract, starting in the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the intestines. Most of the time, it's going to be inflammation in the intestines themselves, both the small and large intestines, but it can be really anywhere in the GI tract. And there's going to be patches along the GI tract of this inflammation. Signs and symptoms of Crohn's disease include five to six loose, non-bloody stools a day, abdominal pain or cramping, especially in the right lower quadrant, abdominal distension or bloating, nausea and vomiting, fever, weight loss, and sometimes severe weight loss due to the malabsorption of the food. Remember, inflammation causes loss of function. What's the function of our GI tract? To absorb nutrients and, and uh, fluids. And so if it's not functioning right, we're not getting the nutrition and hydration that we need. So it can release, lead to things like malnutrition, mouth ulcers, because those inflammatory areas, inflammation areas can be anywhere in the GI tract from the mouth down to the rectum. Um, and then we can see something like abscesses, which are little pockets of, of infection, or fistulas, which are little tunnels that connect um, the bowel to another organ. Uh, for example, the bowel to the bladder. Or, and these fistulas happen because all of the layers of the mucosal lining of the GI tract are affected. And so you get inflammation through the entire lining of the intestines, and that inflammation can eat away at the intestinal lining, 
and cause it to adhere to other organs and then cause tunneling and create these fistulas. Now, the GI tract, not sterile, right? It's full of poop. The bladder, for example, is a sterile environment. So you have a tunnel, now a pathway from your bowel to your bladder, it's not a good thing. Um, and so these are some of the more uh, significant or severe complications that can happen from Crohn's disease. Crohn's disease is going to be diagnosed through um, radiographs, specifically some kind of scope. So they can do a colonoscopy or a sigmoidoscopy where under moderate sedation, um, the GI doctor puts a camera up through the rectum and can visualize the actual intestines and look for those patches of inflammation. Um, and uh, we can also do labs. So labs are going to show loss of uh, some blood loss due to the leakage of blood from the inflammatory areas. So low hemoglobin and low hematocrit. We can see an elevated white blood cell count due to the inflammatory process and the activation of the immune system. And we can, as always, see those non-specific inflammatory markers, C-reactive protein and ESR being elevated. So it really is a combination of uh, diagnostic radiographs combined with lab studies and then combined with the patient's signs and symptoms that give someone a diagnosis. So remember, it's genetics plus trigger, and there's a lot of things that can trigger autoimmune disorders for patients. Things like stress and uh, the wrong foods and illness can certainly trigger some kind of autoimmune response. So we want to encourage patients to get adequate rest. There are some medications, uh, five amino salicylates and steroids, antidiarrheal medications that can be helpful. And we're going to talk about those five amino salicylates in just a second. Um, teaching the patient to avoid food triggers. Um, and so they may take a, a food journal and find out what foods trigger them specifically. Oftentimes it's cow's milk and sugar. Now here's a key point in medical management. If the patient is hospitalized, they're gonna have an IV and we're keeping them NPO because we want to allow their bowel, bowel to rest and to allow that inflammation to cool off. And since they have an IV, no big deal. They're gonna get all the fluids they need to stay hydrated. But if they're managing this at home during an exacerbation of their Crohn's, they're going to be on clear liquids. Why? Because they don't have an IV at home and they're gonna dehydrate really fast if we keep them NPO without an IV, right? So during an acute exacerbation in the hospital, NPO with IV fluids at home, clear liquids. And that's just during an acute inflammation to allow the gut to kind of cool off. We don't want to give, put anything in the gut that's going to make it worse. In general, um, in between exacerbations, uh, we want to encourage a high protein and high calorie diet so that the food that they are eating is very calorically dense and gives them the nutrition that they need. Encourage a low fiber diet. There are some studies out there that are showing a plant-based diet um, free of animal products can actually decrease the irritation inflammation, but your textbook still says to go with a low fiber diet. So we're going to stick with that for today. So your textbook encourages high protein, high calorie, low fiber diet, but be aware that in real life, you want to look at best practices because some of that is evolving. Um, patients with Crohn's disease should not have alcohol or caffeine, which can trigger their uh, inflammation. And we want to encourage small, frequent meals. So think about if you had some kind of sore or wound on your body. And every time, you know, if you've ever had a paper cut, for example, and every time you go to hand sanitize with alcohol, it, it stings and it irritates that area. Well, imagine you've got like areas of stinging all throughout your, in, your gut. And so every time you put food on there, it kind of stings and irritates it and makes it worse. So we want to, you know, try to keep their gut cool and try not to aggravate it so that it can heal. But for now, let's go ahead and talk about that new drug category that we have not talked about yet, 5-amino salicylates. So 5-amino salicylates, the most common one is sulfasalazine. And the way it works is that it inhibits the, produ the production of prostaglandins in the gut. Prostaglandins are inflammatory chemicals that cause more inflammation. So if you block the production of prostaglandins, you're going to have less inflammation. And it specifically just does this in the gut. So it works very directly on the area that we need it to. 
Some of the side effects that you should warn the patient about is that this medication does cause their body fluids to become orange or yellow tinged. So their sweat, their urine, their tears um, can look orange or yellow and it can stain their clothes. So they may not wanna wear their, their favorite, most expensive pair of underwear while they're on, on this drug because it will probably stain. Um, patients can also experience headache, low appetite or nausea, um, sun sensitivity, and in males, it can uh, produce a reduced sperm count, but once they stop the medication, that reverses. And so if, if a male is trying to have a family, he would wanna be counseled on the impact that that can have on his sperm count as they're trying to get pregnant. Now, rare side effects with this medication include an allergic reaction or inflammation of another organ, like the pancreas, the kidneys, uh, the lining of the lungs or the liver. We call those pancreatitis, nephritis, hepatitis, and pneumonitis. So we just wanna look for any of those complications that could arise. Patients who have a sulfa allergy, there is a cross allergy to this medication because it's a sulfa salazine, right? Get it? Um, and so patients with sulfa allergies would not be uh, encouraged to take this medication as they may be allergic to it. And also um, sulfa salazine reduces the absorption of folic acid in the gut. And so patients should be on a folic acid supplement so that they don't get too low in that nutrient. Finally, we would wanna teach our patients to take this on a full, full stomach. And again, for males who take this, we wanna discuss the impact on their sperm count um, and their decisions with family planning. Now, in terms of surgical management, now for ulcerative colitis, surgery sometimes is an option. But for Crohn's disease, we get patches of inflammation throughout the, the intestines. And so surgery doesn't really help because if you remove this one area of inflamed, you know, uh, of area, well, we've got these five other areas. Or even if you remove this and this was the only area that was causing problems, later you can get inflammation in another part of the gut. It just kind of comes and goes and changes areas. And so there's no cure and surgery is not really indicated um, because the inflammation can be in multiple places inside the gut. So some of the complications we've discussed already, abscesses, fistulas, and strictures. And so here's what a normal intestine looks like, nice and pink and healthy with a happy intestinal wall and a normal intestinal surface. But in Crohn's disease, this is what it looks like. They get this thickened wall, which causes um, strictures. Strictures means like a narrowing of the gut. So the stool can't pass through very well. We get this cobblestone appearance inside the gut, which is not great for absorption of nutrients. We can see little tiny tears called fissures in the intestinal wall due to all the pressure um, that happens uh, from the buildup of uh, these strictures and the passage of stool through these um, strictures. And then we can get abscesses, which are little pockets of inflammation and infection in the intestinal wall. So these are all those complications that you'd have to be watching for. As always, let's go ahead and talk through the nursing process as it pertains to Crohn's disease. Now, in terms of assessment, um, we know that we're looking for complications related to the disease. And so frequent diarrhea is going to cause a loss of fluid and electrolytes and also puts the risk of hypokalemia. So you're going to go back to what you know about fluid and electrolyte management and assessing for electrolyte imbalances to make sure the patient has a good fluid volume status as well as normal electrolyte levels. In terms of nursing diagnoses, nursing diagnoses or problems can be things like deficient fluid volume, diarrhea, imbalanced nutrition, less than the body requirements because of that malabsorption, the, the lack of function of the intestinal wall, and ineffective coping. You know, frequent trips to the bathroom, not knowing if something's going to trigger you, um, having exacerbations where the patient is just in severe pain and um, can really impact someone's quality of life. And so ineffective coping can be something that's, that patients will struggle with. When someone is having a Crohn's exacerbation, here are the things we're going to assess. 
Um, we're going to look at their vital signs because of those fluid and electrolyte imbalances. Look at their nutritional intake. What can they tolerate? How much are they getting? What's the frequency and characteristic of their stool? Strict INO, daily weights, fluid and electrolyte status. And we're also going to check them for psychosocial um, um, their psychosocial status, uh, as this can really be uh, taxing mentally, not only physically, but mentally um, and emotionally as well. Okay, so that's our first intervention that we assess. The second intervention is that we take action. So here are the kinds of actions we can take for patients with Crohn's. We can encourage small frequent meals so that we're not just loading up that gut with all sorts of meat food all at once. We can encourage patients to engage in mealtime with family, even if it's not a time where they feel comfortable eating. Sometimes the association of food can be very anxiety provoking. And so patients may be avoiding those types of things. And we want to encourage the socialization of mealtimes um, to make those things still very positive. Encouraging rest um, as things like stress and lack of sleep can trigger autoimmune disorder um, exacerbations. Lots of therapeutic communication and establishing a therapeutic relationship. Um, making appropriate referrals to an immunologist, a GI doctor, a nutritionist. There's lots of people that this patient needs on their team. Making sure pain management is addressed and providing really good skin care as skin care as skin can break down due to having frequent um, bouts of diarrhea. And finally, what are we going to teach our patients? Well, we're going to talk about the importance of adequate nutrition, um, talking about the indication actions and side effects of medications they're prescribed so they know what they're taking and why, and the importance of regular follow-ups and their annual colonoscopy to look for the progression of their disease. And how are we going to know we did a good job? What are we going to evaluate? Well, we're going to evaluate that the patient is able to maintain a healthy weight. That means they're absorbing the proper amount of calories they need to sustain their body. We're going to assess that they have stable vital signs. And again, that's a sign of good fluid volume status. And we're going to look at those fluid and electrolyte balance and make sure that their electrolytes, especially their sodium and potassium, stay in the normal range and that they have good hydration. If we can have their gut absorbing nutrients, getting the fluid that they need and absorbing electrolytes, then we are in good shape. And what we want is have good quality of life for these patients with Crohn's. And that's gonna wrap it up for our dis discussion on Crohn's disease. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.